All right, we'll call the meeting to order for Wednesday, February 17th, 2021. Uh, the formalities of this meeting is being recorded. All votes will be taken via roll call and in attendance from the select board is myself, David Phil, Jane Nevinsmith, Joyce Chunglo, John Waskevitz, and Christian Stanley. So we'll roll right into the uh, consent agenda here. And we have minutes from May 6th, 2020, May 20th, 2020, June 3rd, 2020, June 10th, 2020. And we have warrants AP2132, AP2132S, AP2133, AP2133S, and AP2133V. So moved. Second. Okay, motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Uh, comment, thank you, Jennifer, for getting all these minutes cost, caught up. I know you've had a busy year. All right. You're welcome. Yeah. They're going to keep coming, I promise. <laughs> all right. Any other discussion on this? Jennifer? Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. Thank you. All right, we'll go on to public comments. Uh, we'll allow 15 minutes. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less so that others can speak. If anybody is here for public comments, please turn on your camera or wave that digital hand so we can call on you. Anybody? Mr. Feiden? Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for letting me speak here. Um, I just wanted to speak quickly about an issue that I uh, that I saw at the uh, a recent city council uh, uh, a select board meeting, and that was uh, re regarding the chairman of the board of health, Ms. Mosley, and she was giving her update and answering questions. And during that questioning, uh, we uh, the, the board came to discuss the. Um, when we might be able to let up on some of the lockdowns of some of the uh, businesses that are, are, fa are facing. And her answer, um, and I'm paraphrasing that, is, was that basically uh, how many deaths are we willing to accept? We could, we could open up more businesses, we could release some of the lockdowns. How many deaths are we willing to accept? And uh, I, was, I was pretty appalled by that answer. And um, because it's not accurate, it's not, there's no correlation between lockdowns and COVID deaths or COVID cases. And this is not just, you know, my opinion. There are studies that have that have documented this. There, uh, there's there was one just uh, last month from Denmark, an international study, no uh, that found there was no real value as far as COVID deaths um, for uh, based on the lockdown. There was another one from Stanford University. Uh, that found the same thing. There's no value in the lockdowns as far as preventing COVID deaths. Um, there's also, there's so much anecdotal evidence out there right now that everybody can see for themselves. There's Florida, which has been open for months, which has uh, is, is done much better than us and still continues to do better than us. There's states all over the, all over the country that have had less lockdowns that have done better than us. And I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that fewer lockdowns results in better results. I'm saying that there's no correlation. And that's just, uh, that's, what the, that's what the data shows us. That's what the statistics show us. So for the chairman of the, of the Board of Health to make that statement, to kind of shrug her shoulders and say, hey, you know, how many deaths do you want on your shoulders? Um, I, I found that to be manipulative and really misleading. And I don't think it was, I, I don't think we're being well served with that kind of response. Uh, you, the, uh, the the this has to be based on facts and um, and data and for to, to be kind of you know uh, as I said it's manipulative I, I found that very up, up putting I, and um, but there are frankly there are correlations that we can look at and um, to be helpful I could I could list a few of those and you can you know don't take my word for it but look look for yourself we can talk about when you're talking about releasing the lockdowns, think about how many deaths are you willing to accept from suicides? Because suicide ideation, suicides are up, even among children. 
Um, that's that's a fact that you can research. Based that's because of the lockdowns. Uh, how many deaths are we willing to accept because of drug overdoses? We were just starting to turn the corner on the opioid epidemic when the COVID hit, and that has increased by in some places up to 30%. We're seeing many more deaths due to drug overdoses, alcoholism. That's actual, um, that can be linked to the lockdowns, to the isolation. Um, how many, how much, how much uh, homelessness are we willing to accept? From the lockdowns, people that have lost their businesses, lost their jobs. Um, that's another fact, a factor that plays into all this. And you can, you can look at that data and it's, it's, it's pretty troubling. We're gonna be dealing with those, with that for a long time. Um, child abuse, another very difficult one. In fact, um, you can look in, in many areas, the child abuse reports have gone, have dropped dramatically. That's not because people are, there's, there are fewer abused children, it's because it's not being reported. Children are not in schools, they're not seeing their doctors, they're not seeing their social workers. In other words, it's, we've, we've created the situation where child abuse is being hidden. That's something that needs to factor in the decision. These are, and I could go on, I know that we're limited on time, so I'll just end it, end it with that and just I'll, I'll say, look, look at these facts. When you, when you, and, and for someone who's in a position of power to shrug your shoulders and say, hey, hey, you know, we could release the lockdowns, but you know, you'll have blood on your hands, basically. And I'm not saying those were her words, but that's the way I took it. I, I think that is, we're not being well served by that. Thank you. Well, thanks for taking the time to come to public comments. Sure. I hope I just I hope that uh, Mr. Feiden, I certainly uh, appreciate you sharing it with us as a select board, but I hope you also have uh, sent a letter to the Board of Health to express your concerns also. I think you know we understand where you're coming from, but since that comment was made uh, from a Board of Health uh, chairperson, please send them uh, a, a notice also of, of your feelings. I think that would be appropriate. If I may just add, I, I know I, I wanted to, I don't want to take uh, more time, but I, I do have a, one quick issue that I should bring up is that in, in, in relating to the Board of Health back last summer, um, when the board was debating mask ordinances, there was an issue uh, that I, I attended a Board of Health meeting and I brought up a, uh, an open meetings violation. It was a pretty clear one. And I brought it to their attention, and they kind of acknowledged it, they, that they admitted kind of editing what had they, what they had voted on and what had actually passed. So um, I left that meeting thinking that it was going to be acknowledged and, and addressed, and it wasn't. And I, after you know, after several weeks, I filed a open meetings complaint with the town clerk and with the board of health. And you know, there's a lot going on. I didn't, and I have a lot going on, but. It was never, it, it was never responded to, and that was what six months ago. I wrote a letter. I, I wrote an email to the board of health last week asking why this is not responded to because it's a lot. You know, the open meetings is a lot, and the by law you have thirty days they have to respond, even if they think, even if they think there's no merit to my complaint, they right, have right. to respond. That so, wasn't responded to, so I, you know, I. I I'm hoping for a response, and I, I, I think I have no alternative but to bring that to, to the state um, secretary of state to, uh, because you, you know you can't you you can't say obey my laws and not obey the state's laws, which is what I think the board well, is doing. That's another issue, but that's yeah. That's no, I, I I appreciate the comment, and I will I'll send uh, just uh, spank Nabel just a. Uh, email tomorrow if she's not watching, just to kind of remind her to poke Board of Health for that response. Oh, thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, and, and you can directly contract the Ethics Commission or uh, the other state agency there uh, to lodge that complaint along with the clerk's office. Right, right, uh, I'll, I'll look into that. Okay. Well, I appreciate the, the time and uh, anybody uh, Anybody else here for public comments? No. Okay. We'll keep on moving. 
Uh, Carolyn, do you want to, I guess let's do uh, 113 Middle Street real quick because I see Philip is here and well, he was, where'd he go? There he is. All right. Hi. So this is the license that we had discussed um, probably a couple months ago now and for the driveway and we've kind of gone back and forth and I think we have a, a good final draft here. Uh, the, the last change, I think, from the draft that the board may have seen just came in today, um, and, and he, he agreed to waive any claims to adverse possession in the future um, as part of this license. So I'm, I'm happy with what I see. Um, anybody else have any, get a chance to review that, have any issues? No, as long as our lawyers have uh, reviewed it and have uh, given the okay on it, then I'm fine with it also. So yeah, we, we went for the, the concept. We just needed the legal thing. And if you've read it thoroughly, because I just saw it now, um, and you agree with it, I'm okay with it. So what I'd like is if we could have a motion to approve this uh, subject to final town council review. And if you could give uh, me permission to sign on behalf of the town. So that way, uh, Philip can move on with his, uh, his project without having to wait for another select board meeting, if that's all right. So moved. Okay. Motion by Jane. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Joyce. Any other discussion on this? Philip, did you want to add anything? Or are, you, are you good with um, so that? So not really, just I'm curious, you guys vote on it, then, then the lawyer looks at it, and then it's, then we, everyone has to sign it, right? So yeah, basically we have to sign it, you have to sign it, but I just, because we did make that change, I just want a quick review by, by town council just to make sure there's sure. no your issues, but uh, that's it's fine. pretty straightforward, so. Yep. No, I'm, I'm, I got no questions at this point. Okay. All right, uh, Jennifer? We'll call vote Phil? Yes. Chunglo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Ms. Gevitz? Yes. Thank you. All right, we got that out of the way, so hopefully you can get your, your project underway soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Right. Thanks for coming tonight. Have a good night. All right, you too. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to do the budget update? Do you think you can get that in in 15 minutes or less? Absolutely, I can, depending on any questions you have. But um, I, I do want to take this opportunity to thank our town treasurer, uh, Linda Sanderson, our principal assessor, Abbott, and our collector, Susan Golotsky. So we began about six weeks ago meeting to review uh, fiscal year 21's expenses and revenues and where we were at the status year to date. And I can tell you they have spent hours dissecting each line item and following and analyzing the ebb and flow of the town's revenue and the expenses and its impact on the budget. And as, as I've mentioned before, David Nixon, our former town administrator, he had an uncanny knack of projecting expenses and revenue despite the financial status of the economy, no matter what year it was. And um, I just wanna remind you, he lowered the projected targets for this year um, a year ago in a year that was an absolute mystery for any financial planner. Uh, no one has lived through a year like 2020, but he was very, very close on target. It was remarkable. So utilizing the history and the expertise of these three individuals, I am confident that we are presenting a realistic analysis of where Hadley is now and, and will be at the end of this fiscal year. So I'm going to ask Jennifer, Jennifer, can you share that document um, that has the snapshot that we're going to talk about? Yes, if you'll keep talking, I'll pull it right up. Oh, I should have given you a warning. I should have had you pulling it up. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just begin talking about it as it comes up. But um, just to give you a review of the revenues that we've received year to date, the real estate and the personal property taxes are ahead of the year-to-date target at about 58.32%. And FY21 totals are expected to come in at the projected target amount by the end of fiscal year. So remember, this is not a normal year, and David Nixon targeted a much lower um, revenue, and it, but we are close to those targets. 
the local receipts are lagging behind year-to-date target at about 45%. A detailed review of projected versus actual receipts was done to see if this should be of concern. As it turns out, there are significant amounts in local receipts that come in during the second half of the year, most significantly the motor vehicle excise tax of 700,000 and PDTA of 202,000. Local receipts do show significant decreases in some areas. They have so far been offset by increases in other areas, which um, I'll talk about in a couple bullets. Uh, state aid receipts are close to target at 54%, and totals are expected to come in at the projected target amount by the end of fiscal year. So our areas of concern are local receipts is the most volatile as it that is the revenue source most closely connected to the immediate local economy. Most impacted in, two, in fiscal year 21 have been meals and rooms tax. I don't think that's any surprise. Rooms tax is coming in under the original estimates. Meals tax is coming in higher. Both should fully recover, but we don't know when. Departmental fees, these collections are doing fairly well, though FY21 totals may come in lower than the estimated 500,000. The ambulance rebate, this was estimated at 100K lower than FY20 receipts and came in 30K lower than that. This will rise again, but not probably not till FY22. That is a one-time amount, so it, it'll definitely not be until FY22. Some precautionary steps, um, as noted above, the local receipt items rely on the economic health of our community continuing at the current levels or better. So as a precaution, we've initiated monitoring, careful monitoring of above sources of revenue, complete review monthly, and this is taking place, actually it's been taking place weekly for this preparation, but it will continue monthly. Um, curbing spending, I did, uh, at the department heads meeting, I did ask them to curb any unnecessary spending with their budgets, um, but I really ensured them that there isn't going to be a penalty to departments for returning funds. Um, you, you there's a, always a fear among municipalities that if department heads don't spend everything and pretend it's Christmas in June, that they're not gonna get it back. And I, I really wanna reassure them and remind the select board as well as the finance committee that um, I, I don't wanna penalize any of them for giving money back. Um, in tracking rollba rollbacks, department heads have been asked to provide estimates of year-end rollbacks, no penalty department, again, for not spending budgeted form, uh, funds. And I've already received um, from one department an expectation um, of what they may be able to return back. Um, and, and finally, I do wanna talk about sewer fees. Um, I think I've been hinting at it. Uh, they have not been self-sustaining for quite some time. Uh, the finance team with Chris Okafar have met and um, I think we have some really good suggestions to, to ask the select board to consider, but we'll do that at, uh, when we present the FY22 budget. Um, I think it'll, it'll, we've got some good options for you to decide to see how to address those, that sh ongoing shortfall, um, temporary as, long and, and as well as long-term. So that is a snapshot and I have the crew here on the call if you have any questions that you need specifically answered. No, it, that's that's helpful, and thanks uh, all of you for your work on this. And and I do want to. My feeling is, I just want to echo it. No department's going to be penalized because they return money back rather than spending it. Um, it we're not the federal government <laughs> in that way. So uh, anything you can return is is helpful and kind of helps us get through this another rough year. But on the same note, if, if you need something and if we do end up level funding, you, you know, you really need to discuss it with the administrator and, and purchase it and move on, you know. I, I just would like to say that, I mean, it looks really uh, promising in a hard year uh, that everybody mm -hmm. is looking on target like this and there aren't any you know, we could be looking at shortfalls in a lot of areas and it looks like, you know, everything is, is right around where it's projected. So uh, again, what Carolyn said is just good job projecting all those numbers and, and budgeting for the town so that we could meet everything. Um, it, it looks good. 
Um, and just a, uh, on the ambulance rebate, a question there, uh, wasn't it, it, it was low, there was an announcement that it was lower um, than two years ago, I believe, where we basically paid for it. So are you saying it is expected to go even lower than the past um, rebate we got? And this is a clarification, I just, yeah. it's unclear. So Linda, you want to take a shot at it? Let me take, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, yes, last year it completely paid for itself in fiscal 19. That was the first year that the amount that we paid um, for it, uh, for the services was fully rebated. We received $267,500. So, and that was the uh, contracted amount. So basically it's self-funded in fiscal 20. I mean, I didn't mean 19, fiscal 20. And then going into 21, it was recognized uh, that, uh, especially since we were already, these plans were being made in the second half of the year, that when you uh, sh shut down the schools and send everyone home in March, uh, that there were significantly uh, fewer, and also others, uh, other people too uh, were not on the road as much, that the ambulance calls did, uh, were already seeing a decline at the end of FY20. Um, the, and when we receive our rebate, uh, which came in, um, their calculations are done um, based on the prior year. So what we received um, this year, instead of being the 267,500, we received 138,922. So that's about $130,000 less. Uh, and that's it. 20, uh, fiscal 20 has already happened. They are, uh, it's possible we'll, uh, some, some more money will come in. They're going to do a look, uh, a second look at some point to see if there were any collections in the current year from um, FY20 invoicing. So we might get a little bit more, but um, this is not one of those uh, areas where we continue to get receipts. We get that one payment and then maybe a little bit more. So then going into next year, uh, Christian, um, we're, ex we're expecting it um, not to go lower, but we're, I think what we were saying is already has gone low. We're expecting it to come back during FY21. Um, and then we would receive that payment a year from now. So we'll have, we'll have a lot of notice. We'll, we'll know how it's going in the next few months. We'll keep in touch with Chief and see, see what's uh, happening. But we are in fact doing better having our own ambulance service than uh, paying out to Amherst for it. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. I, I think as school gets into better situation than what Amherst is in right now, uh, and hopefully towards the summer or the fall, um, we'll see business and traffic pick up, which we haven't had over the last uh, year, actually. We've been down uh, with the amount of traffic, and that's re usually where a lot of our business comes from. Um, so, you know, I can only think, hope it, that things will pick up <laughs> the second half of this year. Not the ambulance ones, but you know what okay. I mean. So, Joyce, it was difficult. It, it was difficult as we were trying. Literally, this this is the type of conversations we would have. It's like, why is that number down? And that would be in every line item. And it and we we talked, and 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 Chief gave us information. You know, this, all the students aren't back. The traffic's not there. There's no reunions. There's no graduations. Those are the events that usually, unfortunately, would require an ambulance if someone was ill or whatever. So if you think of all of the things that COVID impacted, whether it be a large gathering of people, they, they aren't happening. And especially the beginning, you know, the, the spring of last year and summer, people just weren't out. And um, so, yeah, those are one of, some of the hard conversations that we kind of have, have to try to figure out why revenues were down. But, but, the, but the number of... Um patients or the number of people having to go to the hospital is certainly not for the lack of the hospital not being busy because we have been busy mm -hmm. and full. So, you know, unfortunately there are sick people and it's not all related to COVID to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. um, so, and when people are sick nowadays, they're sick because they wait to the last minute before they actually go 
uh, and go to a hospital because of COVID. So they wait longer and then they're sicker. So um, that's not a good thing to do either. So hopefully things are going to turn around and that's all we can pray for at this time. Any last questions for the finance team? No? Jennifer, can you just make a copy of that or, or email me that page? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's important. Okay. All right. Thanks. Just one more quick question. I hope it doesn't take too long. Is just the state aid being down so much? I would think that would almost be the other way around, but is it's, it, it's not down. Are, are you looking at 20? Are you comparing to the prior year? Yeah, that's what I'm. Okay. Comparing. All right. All right. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, yeah okay. Let, let me, <laughs> let me explain that. Um, th this year uh, we, we netted out state aid, uh, the assessments against it and the chart and the uh, offsets. We took it out. What we're seeing now in the net state aid is um, what we actually receive. Um, prior years, and David was doing it and it was, it was just actually just a little hard to work with. Um, I mean, he has it straight in his head, but what he has for gross as state aid is gross. So on the first page of the cherry sheet, it says, here's everything that we're giving you. And, and then they take off the offsets. And then you go to the second page and here's everything we're assessing you. And he would put that on the, on the expense side. So we're netting it down and putting it in the front because what we actually vote at town meeting, you see that block in the middle where it says total funding sources. We actually only uh, use the net of it when we do the vote at town meeting for the funding for the budget. So we're just trying to be consistent with just move how, we're, how we're using it. Excuse me. Oh, I, Joyce have, um, anyways, that's, we just found it easier to work with it this way. And, and, and um, so next year they'll be more comparable, but in truth, it's not down Christian, actually it's up higher than we originally voted um, than it was when we voted. So we actually came in because cherry sheets didn't come in until December and we did the voting, you know, at the town meetings were both over by then. And they actually came in um, 127,000 higher than had been anticipated. So we're, we're doing okay with state aid. Okay, that makes sense. And yeah, it's my first time looking at it, but now I saw net and gross. And so that was I know, I know. But I'd be happy to send you the specific figures, really, if you, I'd be ha you know, happy to send that to you. You want that? Oh, that's okay. That's okay. okay. All righty. <laughs> All right. Any last questions? All right. Well, thank you guys for working on that. I know it's a long term process. Are you, uh, Carolyn, what do you think for a budget presentation? Are you still kind of thinking March or? Yeah, I would like to do March 17th. I think that's the meeting that will do that presentation. Okay. All right, sounds good. Let's, uh, Dr. Mosler's here. Let's do the COVID-19, what did she? There she is, all right, she's coming back. You ready to do the COVID-19 update, Dr. Mosler? Oh, you're muted still. Dead. There we go. Uh, the most dangerous of ways to be. Uh, yeah, I just want to read a little thing here and uh, give you a, a, an update on, on the goings on. Uh, we're in the midst of a public health crisis. There's been an explo explosive increase in COVID-19 cases at UMass Amherst. Uh, we know that 50%, 57% of positive cases are asymptomatic while actively infectious, and that there are new variants with a rate of infectivity 40 to 60% higher than the original strain. We do not yet know if a new variant is contributing to this local outbreak, but it is certainly possible. In the situation we're confronted with right now, best public health practice makes clear that immediate action is the only way to mitigate the spread. To wait and see if we have an increase in positive cases in Hadley prior to enacting measures to limit spread goes against best, best public health practices. It does not work. UMass has properly taken the severe measure of self-sequestering all students, both on and off campus. This was not done casually. 
This was done with input from the State Department of Public Health and other stakeholders. This means no going out to work, no going to the gym, no going to restaurants for indoor dining for all UMass students. The university has set up a fund to help students who may be in financial crisis due to the order to self sequester. Recognizing that we were in an emergency situation, working in concert with the Department of Public Health, UMass and the surrounding towns, the Hadley Board of Health took immediate action. We continued the governor's reduced indoor capacity order for businesses to 25% and reinstated the governor's 9.30 p.m. curfew. This was done with the support of our town government. We have educated local businesses about the UMass policy and the Hadley emergency orders in order to support the university in their effort to keep students home. The Hadley Board of Health maintains close connection to the town government the select board and the town manager were engaged in decision-making. This was not a decision made independently by the Hadley Board of Health. The Hadley Board of Health is acutely aware of the economic impact of our actions. We wanna keep our schools open, protect our elders, and ensure that those who do patronize our, social, our local businesses feel as safe as possible while doing so. We recognize this is a challenge to our businesses, but we feel very strongly that by taking action now, our business community will be better positioned moving forward. The Hadley Board of Health is not tasked with enforcing the UMass regulations. However, we are supporting the UMass policy by encouraging our businesses to remind students who present themselves that they are to stay at home. We're monitoring the situation closely. I communicated with the State uh, Department of Epidemiology as well as UMass today. Uh, with 50 new cases confirmed yesterday, uh, we are not out of the woods yet and the level of concern remains high. Once it is deemed advisable by the state epidemiologists and UMass and uh, our local partners, we will rescind our emergency orders. I'm done. All right. The, uh, Jane was just talking about uh, vaccines for 65 and older. Do you have any update Tomorrow, on that? Open, open tomorrow. Uh, the, the state is, uh, they have, um, I don't know what the right word is, kind of rearranged, uh, uh, reconfigured their, their thoughts on vaccine access. And they are uh, encouraging uh, and promoting the large vaccination sites as, and the pharmacies uh, as opposed to uh, more local efforts. I think that Amherst and Northampton now are working to form a regional uh, program so that they can continue vaccinating at their sites. But there's definitely been a shift uh, by the state uh, Department of Public Health from encouraging smaller uh, clinics. They're trying to move away from that and really uh, uh, get people to go to the larger vaccine sites in order to, for efficiency, to get more vaccines out there. Also, starting tomorrow morning, uh, people 65 and older are, can get vaccines. The state has a website, go to mass.gov COVID and you can sign up online. If you are not computer literate, they have a phone number called 211. And there's several things you have to listen like English and Spanish and if you want this and if you want that. But when you get to the question that says COVID, that's the one you want. And then they will help you set up an appointment for somewhere near you. Yeah, and Jennifer has kindly uh, posted all of this information on the Hadley website. On the front page, on the COVID page, in the town news, it is everywhere. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Moser? No. Okay. Well, thanks for coming, Dr. Moser. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a good thank evening. You. Thank you to Dr. Moser. It sounds like a rough, rough job right now. So thank you for doing it. Well, thank you. All right, let's uh, jump down to the uh, David? Yes. 
Can the senior center has a request regarding COVID and opening. Is this an appropriate time? Uh, yeah, we can do that. Let's let's talk about reopening. I guess now. Okay. The Hadley Senior Center requests permission to permit indoors groups never to exceed ten people at a time for Hadley seniors who have received both COVID nineteen vaccine shots and can provide verification. Mask will be required and social distancing practiced. There will be groups of no more than 10 plus instructor for exercise classes for 30 minutes maximum. Art classes, book club, discussion and knitting groups would be limited to 60 minutes. We would require pre-registration for all events. The living room would be available again by pre-registration for a maximum of three people to visit for a maximum of 60 minutes with 60 minutes between uses of the living room. Surfaces would be wiped down by participants as they leave and the disinfectant spray that the fire chief provided for us would be used by staff in the rooms that were used on a daily basis. Um, there's basically one exercise class each day of the week and probably only one of the other classes each day of the week. So it's not like a big crowd's gonna be showing up there all at once. Yeah, sounds reasonable to me. Anybody else? I know, Patrick, I know you're here to talk about uh, some aspects too, so we'll jump right to you next. Yes, thank you. I think the one-on-one -on -one thing should stay in effect right now with the library and the senior center. I didn't hear you, John. It says, I think the one on one on one should stay in effect right now for the library and for the senior center. I don't know what that means. Your our last meeting, we said one person in to use the facilities for exercising for That's ex the fitness room, right? This, this proposal that we're making is for people who have had both of their COVID vaccines. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, this is the new norm, as they like to say. And so the, they've gotten both vaccines. They're still going to be masked up and distanced as, as they can be. So, I mean, it's time to, in my opinion, let the, uh, the seniors get out and exercise and try to have a normal life. And as Mr. Feigen said, socialization is an important part of this and seniors don't have much longer to do it. Let's be serious. Yeah, I, I was going to say, Jane, just, um, you know, is it, have you guys, I, I have other senior centers, are they doing similar things? And is there, I don't know what it's like to get a vaccine if you get paperwork or whatnot. So you is do, you there get a little card that says, okay, you got the vaccine on this date and which vaccine you got. And we will actually keep track of those just like we do doctor's permissions to exercise. Yeah, I mean- Other, I'm other senior centers don't have nearly the state of the art building we have in terms of air circulation. I mean, one of the ones you're most familiar with is the Bang Center and they're not open. Um, Northampton is, um, obviously open for COVID shots and they're talking about opening, but it's a hard process. But because of our filtration system and the air circulation, we feel comfortable with what's going on. And, you know, this is something we can certainly reassess, you know, every two weeks when we have select board meetings, if we have something that pops up, we can always take a look. And I know that uh, Haley is, has a reopening plan and she's keeping careful track, so. Do we need a motion to do anything like this or do we uh, just, are we going to just implement the policy? I, I say let's have a motion that way we can make it official just in case. Yeah, I can just make a motion that we open the senior center to limited groups per Jane's uh, outline that have been vaccinated and have proof of the vaccination and still follow COVID safety protocols. Can I get a second? I'll second it. All right, motion by Christian, second by Jane. 
Any other discussion on this? Jennifer? Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Tungalo? Mm. She's gone. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Wiskevitz? No. Okay. And I believe Joyce said that she might have to pop in and out as the evening progressed. Okay. So. Jane, is that, that it for the Senior Center for reopening? Yes. Okay, let's jump over to Patrick then for the library. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we have a similar, a similar request, although it's not related to you know, vaccinations because we're dealing with a wider age range of um, people that use the library. But essentially what we'd like to do is allow people, either individuals to come in and use the, the small meeting room for you know, quiet study or whatever kind of you know, solo work they need to do um, <clears throat> or groups of up to four to use the small meeting room or the larger meeting room um, for you know other purposes, whether it's you know just any kind of a meeting that people need to have, tutoring, that kind of a thing. Um, both of these rooms are accessible from the lobby of the of the library, so you don't actually enter the main space. The rest of the building will remain closed. Uh, the public restrooms are off of the lobby, so that's accessible. And you know, my feeling is at this point we've had a number of requests to use meeting space. Uh, and I'd like to be able to offer it because I think, you know, if the groups are small and they maintain physical distancing, keep their masks on, that <clears throat> it's about as safe as any kind of interaction can be. Um, so I think it's something that we, you know, should try to offer to the community, especially students and, you know, people that are having trouble working from home. And Patrick, you had sent over, it was this afternoon, right, the updated meeting room policy to Carol? Yes. So we, okay. the, the trustees um, created a, a full meeting policy before the pandemic hit for the use of those rooms. And this is sort of an addendum. I mean, it, you know, obviously we want the policy to still be in place, but some of those things are obviously not applicable right now. So this tries to address what's different about the policy in the current, you know, the present tense. Yeah. So uh, it is written for any, anyone that's watching, and I'm sure the library can put it out there on their webpage or wherever it needs to be so people are aware of who can use it and how they can use it. So right. uh, I'm, I'm okay with the plan, it sounds reasonable. So, so it's a big space, so there's plenty of room to social distance, so. Right. And Patrick, what, if people are move, meeting in small groups, I, and I'm sorry, I just don't know because we haven't been able to really get into the library and see it, I can't envision the room. So about how far apart from each other will they be? So the, smaller, the smaller meeting room is probably, um, I don't have the square footage, but it, the smaller room, which is going to be for one person at a time, is no more than 200 square feet. The large meeting room is probably more like six or 800 square feet. So there's plenty of room. Um, it's the room at the uh, southwest corner of the building. So if you're ever coming into the parking lot, it's at that corner of the building. You can see right into it. It's a, a very sizable room with a high ceiling. Um, and there's, you know, probably room for like eight tables in there. So if people, you know, spread out, if they're doing a tutoring session and they, you know, maintain, you know, the whatever eight, six or eight feet that's um, appropriate, there's plenty of room in that, in that particular space uh, for people never to be anywhere near each other. Yeah, I can, I can make a motion uh, that we allow the library to open um, for meeting space, uh, scheduled meeting space per, per uh, Patrick's um, document. I'll second. Okay, motion by Christian, second by Jane. Any other discussion on that? Jennifer? Wait a minute, Joyce is muted. Oh, Joyce is talking, but no one can hear her. Uh, that's typical. <laughs> I, I was just saying, is this anything different than what we're allowing at the senior center? We just well, updated the senior center. You missed that. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. I'm good. Thank you. I'm sorry. I had a little something I had to deal with. That's okay. 
All right, Jennifer. Roll call vote. Phil? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. all. Right. Thanks, Patrick. Have a good night. Can you just, you could you, I hate to have you go back again, but could you just tell me what, what, what we did for the senior center? Yes, we're allowing groups never to exceed 10 people for Hadley seniors who have received both COVID-19 vaccine shots and can provide verification. We'll still require masks and social distancing um, and exercise classes will be restricted to 30 minutes. Art classes, book club discussion and knitting groups will be limited to 60 minutes we probably would have one of those 60 minute classes per day. And we have one exercise class per day and they're spread out in time and the rooms are spread out. We're also opening the living room and all of this is by uh, pre-registration. The living room will be available um, for a maximum of three people for one hour at a time. Um, and then an hour between people using the living room. Surfaces will be wiped down by participants and the disinfectant spray that the fire chief provided will be used by staff in the rooms that were used on a daily basis. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Carolyn, do you wanna go into town hall now or do you wanna wait on that? You're muted. I'm sorry, David, can you clarify your question? I wasn't sure what you're asking me. Do you want to talk about town hall reopening at this point or do you want to wait it for a little bit later? Or? Um, I mean, I have not, you know, I, I we were going to reassess at this point whether you wanted to um, look at reopening it, uh, you know, for people to be able to come into the public, have them sign in um, to, you know, take care of business. So. I, I have not had a chance to ask the employees what their perceptions are, how they feel about that. And I knew there was going to be discussions tonight about the other two buildings. So I'm, yeah, I kind of like leaving that in your hand, what, what, what you feel is the best for the public to be coming into the building. So my thoughts on this are we encourage those that can telework to continue to do so. Um, or those that don't feel comfortable working as long as they can do their duties. But um, I mean, everything else in the world is is open. Um, I, I, as long as we're signing in and signing in and signing out like we've been doing now for 10 months, I think it's reasonable to finally allow people to come in and pay their tax bills and just understand that, you know, if, if there's already somebody in line to pay their bill, the other person might have to wait out in the hallway or wait outside. So uh, I see Sue is giving a thumbs up. So she must want to see some human beings somewhere. Yay. <laughs> People will love that. <laughs> and, and that being said, I know that there is uh, some employees that have some concerns health related and just other concerns. Uh, um, so I, I don't have any problems with people continuing to telework if they need to, as long as they're getting the work done. But Joyce, do you have something? No. So do you want to still have an hour a week at the senior center? I would love to do that, Jane, because that provides a, a separate. Um, it, it's easier accessible. It certainly is. It certainly is. Um, I mean, what we've been doing is meeting people out on the back porch and stamping their bills if they want them stamped or whatever, but it would be wonderful to have people back in the building. John, Christian, anything? I, I was going to say as long, you know, I agree with making sure that um, if people you know, unsafe for any reason, just making accommodations for them best we can. Um, but I agree with, um, you know, we're all used at this point to wearing masks, social distancing, 
waiting in lines where we're spread apart. I mean, we have to be able to open things back up somewhat. Uh, so I am for opening it. I just am the only thing I'm worried about, I guess, is, you know, you get somebody that comes in and doesn't want to wear a mask or doesn't want to follow the rules, just that like security risk or whatever it is, um, aspects to things. Um, but, but, uh, otherwise, yeah, I'm totally for it. I don't know. So, I just so, her hand, so, so basically I, when you go to some businesses, it yeah. says no mask, no enter. Yeah. So, you know, that's the same thing that we can use for the town hall. If you don't want a mask, you can't enter. So we're not going to put people at risk. It's that's not what we should be doing. So my question is, is the person who sits at the door where everybody's going to enter, um, who's enforcing that? The person sitting at the door. If you don't have a mask on, you can't come in. So we're going to have people sit at the door, at the front door and the back door for a couple hours a day. We're going to divide up. How, how are we doing that? Nope. No, I, I, I think the easiest way to be just treat it like Walmart, Home Depot, any of those places where we put up a sign up, signs on the doors saying, you know, mandatory masks, no mask, no entry. And, you know, realistically the first person that sees somebody in there without a mask just like at one of those stores uh hands them a mask tells them they need to turn around and go um it's just like any any other establishment i think realistically the only well, time that we allow them in the office uh without a mask is if they have something in writing from their physician saying that they can't tolerate because of breathing, asthma, whatever, but we have to have a written documentation stating why they can't wear a mask. And honestly, so, Joyce, I'm happy to handle those people out on the back porch. That's yeah, fine. that's what I was going to say is if we put yeah, up a yeah. sign basically saying masks are mandatory, if you cannot wear one or don't want to wear one, then you need to stay outside and call the number. Uh -huh. That sounds fun. You can address it that way. You see your doing theirs by the appointment only in a limit of 10. And the library's doing a limit of four to eight unless they have their individual contact person to person or person to research. I don't see why the town hall can't do, do what we're doing now. Call into the office that you want to go to and they'll let you in. That way you don't have 20 people standing in the hallway and the both doors open. Uh, I, don't I, think think, I don't think both doors should be open. I think they should only be able to come in the back door. We have to Where there's back the door. ramp. I, I, I kind of do like having it open with just everybody. Most everybody has a cell phone. Um, how hard is it to call and say, hey, I'm here. Can you let me in? But I don't we know. Have a doorbell on the back door. What's that? And we have a doorbell on the back door. Yeah. And we all take turns answering it. Oh. I think that works well. I, you know, I think that's just going to be less confusing. And then when you do have people in, and, and if you do have trouble with one particular person, then there won't be any issues, you know? And you still should, should track people that come into the building as you're doing now by having them sign in. I think that's important for tracking. Mm -hmm. I think you need a big door and this a uh, big sign on the door that says you must sign in on the paper on the left. Yep. So sign just in. To, so just to be clear, what we're talking about here is we'll put up a sign saying mandatory masks, whatever else, and the phone number they should call if someone needs to enter the building or or tell them to ring the doorbell, and then somebody will let them in to do the business they need to do. Yes. Can we, David? Yep. Can, can we, um, can you kind of delegate this to Carolyn to work with the, those of us who work in town hall? Because there's a, there is a lot to work out. I hear, I, I hear things that Jennifer is saying that I don't think select board members are going to be able to address. Yep. I think it's not, it has, it's, this is a town hall issue. I, you know, those of us who are in the second floor are not going to be taking our turns going and open the door. We have to face sure. that, but that's, that's a town hall issue. And, and can we, can you just sort of send it over to us and, and we'll, we'll work on it. Yep. I have no issue with that. And 
and this is not to say you don't want to see humans, but uh, for someone like yourself that doesn't really need to, you know, inter- interface with the public to collect tax bills or whatever, I have no issue with you saying, sorry, no, I don't, I don't need to see you. So I don't want to at this, you know what I mean? Uh, working oh. from home or whatever you feel you need to do. So I'm not sure, sure out, but, but it doesn't mean I get to jump on them on the first floor and say, you handle all right. my issues for me. So this is why yeah. I think, you know, we need to sort of talk about it in town hall and, and see how, what we can do that those that are taking up the slack for those of us who are not going to answer the door, um, how we can work it out. Uh, we, just, I think we just want to go ahead. The two bu- the building, the town hall is very different from the library and the senior center in the number of people who are working there in different capacities. So at that level, yes, there are many different people to be involved in the decision of who comes in and how it works. And I think Linda's suggestion of working it out amongst themselves is correct. Yeah, yeah so that that's fine with me. Um, you know, the goal is obviously to be careful, but going on, what, almost a year now, slowly start working back to town, town business as normal as we can. So could I get a motion to that effect of what we just kind of talked about and give Carolyn the authority to make that decision? I move that we allow the town hall to open under the guidance of the town administrator and what she can work out with the staff there. Second. Okay, motion by Joyce, uh, sorry, Jane, second by Joyce. Any other discussion on this? I Jennifer. Just that, you know, to see what plan you guys put together. So just so we're aware of what's happening. That's all. Okay. Jennifer. Okay. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Phil. Yes. Chungalo. Yes. Stanley. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Laskevitz. Yes. Thank you. And camper. Right. Thank you too. <laughs> The black cat. I, I just asked George, <laughs> David, is okay if I ask a question? If you would allow me to have some discussion with the town employees tomorrow before we uh, act, get this going, I'd like to. Uh, it, it, I think there's a way we can address it. It may mean some moving around. And if I could have some time just to uh, talk with those employees, especially those who are more concerned about having it open to the public, to be able to accommodate them, it might take me a little bit. Yep. This is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you have full authority to take as long as you need to, to get it done right and do what you need to do. So. Thank you. Um, all right. Anything else? Until next week. That's no big deal at this point. Yeah. Anything else on reopening that we want to talk about before moving on? Let's do, um, Hadley Housing Authority opening. Uh, the select board and the Hadley Housing Authority are seeking an interested resident to serve on the Housing Authority. Uh, Willie Denlinko has resigned from his elected position and has a remaining one year, has one year remaining on his term. Uh, this elected right. position will be on the ballot for April 2022. Uh, so we're looking for somebody to volunteer to be appointed to that position for a one-year time period for now until we can hold the election for the position in 2022. So if you're interested in serving on the Housing Authority, uh, please send a letter of interest to Jennifer, uh, to, you know, to the select board through Jennifer, and we'll look at those uh, next time we meet. I just like to say on that too. I mean, there's uh, just that the diversity committee um, is on the agenda here as well. And I just uh, would like to reach out that anybody that's interested in diversity and equity and those types of things, the Hadley Housing Authority and serving on that board is a really good place to make a difference. Um, so I uh, just like to say that in addition to the announcement. All right. And Christian, I'll come right back to the diversity committee after our uh, appointment at 6.30 here. Okay, so. that's okay. I just wanted to say it because it was right underneath it. And yep. just- no, nope, that's cool. Um, all right, do we have, it looks like Andrew is here for our 6.30 appointment. And let's go down to that. 
So this is uh, 5.1 under the appointments. Uh, Hadleaf Holistics will present their new location and request to renegotiate their community host agreement. Um, my understanding is they've been in front of the ZBA, um, but I know there was some concerns on the select board to have this come back in front of the board since the location had changed and possibly some of the, the, the terms of the host community agreement. The original approval we had was for inside the, the Hampshire Mall um, but that's not happening any longer. So I'll, uh, Andrew, if you want to take it away and kind of introduce what you're, what you're asking for. Well, basically, um, we're looking for a new location. We weren't able to use the long mall location because of, uh, they went to their lender and their lender refused to, uh, give them any additional, uh, financial help or assistance because our business was federally legal. So, we were forced to find a new location. The mall location was great. We would have done it, but unfortunately came back to us and they weren't willing to lease to us. So we then basically uh, started looking for other locations. We tried to find a location similar to the mall within a plaza, within a structure with other storefronts and so what and somewhat. And we weren't able to find anything. And when, when we were able to find something, we were told that, uh, we ran into the same problem. We weren't able to basically get a lease because it was federally legal again, and nobody wanted to jeopardize uh, nobody wanted to jeopardize their mortgage. So we continued looking, and we really weren't able to find a location that fit the criteria. So we started looking at freestanding buildings, and we found one. We found a couple, and we decided to. Uh, uh, go for a variance because we realized that um, the zoning was very, very restrictive and there really weren't too many locations available. So we found the location. We went in front of the planning and zoning board. We got a variance and here we are today. Where, where is it? It's at uh, 251 Russell Street is a map, by the way, here. Um, I'd just like to expand a little bit on that. Um, we did send what's, over, the, what's the form of property? So the, what was it previously? Yeah. It was a CrossFit gym. And then oh. before then, it was our landlord's uh, marketing company who had since moved up, up further up the street to a larger location. It's like that uh, the spin, I think there was a spinning uh, business there. Yeah. Near where the tap room is, like just... Uh, yeah, where, they, where, they had, where they had antique cars there? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I see. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, we had email, I'd emailed over to Jennifer. I don't know if she's forward. You guys are uh, the new blueprints um, along with the, the variance itself and the, uh, uh, the new, our new uh, security plan too, uh, along with the LOI as well that we haven't set with that property. So everything's all, all lined up to go. You know, I just want to reiterate, as Andrew said, you know, we, we searched throughout the town everywhere, calling all the different vacant locations. And, you know, there was only a handful left and, and uh, this was it. Matt was scouting around. He, he did a fabulous job. He pretty, pretty much exhausted every single location that he could find. Um, so here we are again today. Yeah. And, and we do, you know, if you, you guys, we, we, do have some examples of the, the places, you know, WS Properties, which owns the, that whole plaza there where the old KFC is, uh, Walmart, you know, they own a large chunk of those vacant properties that wouldn't, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't touch us. I'll then, say, so have these plans gone before the police and the fire? The new security plans, I did not send yet to the uh, chief of police. It, it didn't vary as much. Um just really a couple of placements of cameras and, and a different, you know, we actually have two entrances in the backside this time as, as opposed to one for delivery. So it actually has a separate delivery entrance. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll send that all over to him. Well, I think this, this freestanding location takes care of one of the select boards concerned about having it around small children. Exactly. Yeah. I'm much happier with that building. Mr. Dwyer, is this all set with the planning board as well? Uh, no, they have not initiated their process with the planning board yet because they didn't have a place. 
Yeah. Um, when and I don't think we have any issue with this. At least I don't. I've been talking with Matt from time to time on this. At the uh, time we adopted the setback rules, we were mainly thinking about. Uh, we're mainly concerned about the setbacks for uh, grow facilities. Um, if you recall back when we were having all of the public hearings about the um, adult use bylaw, the, um, the retail community was basically not there. It was the residential community who was concerned about uh, adjacent growth facilities uh, and the smell of growing product. Um, so a lot of the bylaw was drafted from that perspective and not from the perspective of, uh, of retail. The uh, thing they kept on bumping into, uh, well, first of all, we, we did not know at the time that the malls would not, uh, would not be willing to work with them. In fact, the manager of the mall was very eager to work with them, apparently, uh, the local manager, apparently her, the higher level managers were not. Um, but what they kept on bumping up on is there are residential properties scattered along that stretch of Route 9. Not many, but enough so that they had trouble being more than, and I forget exactly what it was, 500 Three, feet. 300 feet, yeah, 300 feet from a residential. 300 feet from a residential property line. And they're uh, basically the most of the residences, and I don't want to overgeneralize, most are uh, rental properties anyway. Um, so um, I think the, the variance makes sense. Uh, the rest of the process according, under the bylaw is that they have to negotiate a host community agreement with you. And then uh, that's a prerequisite for filing with us for a special permit to operate the retail facility. So are you proposing the only change to the host community agreement currently negotiated and approved by the board is just the address of the business? Yep. Okay. Uh, Christian, I think it was Christian and Jane, were, were you, you were involved in this uh, negotiation originally, right? I know I was with David Nixon. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Are you, are you uh, still happy with the original negotiations? Everything else seemed good to you, Christian? Yeah, I thought it was good. I mean, everything seems good. And, uh, you know, I think I was a little bit on the fence about this because I thought the mall location was good for getting in and out and everything of there. But obviously it's not something where, hey, here's one location and then switching it to another. It's just like, mm -hmm. this is the business and the nature of the beast. So, I mean, I kind of feel like we should get the ball rolling a little bit and get this moving and, uh, you know, this is an empty business right now. It'd be great to have a uh, running a, a business operating out of there. So um, I'm kind of for just moving the ball forward with this. If we could I'm get a motion it. to uh, amend it. the uh, uh, accept the, with the change of address. The only thing I'd like to, friendly amendment, just uh, subject to approval by the police and fire chief uh, of the plans. Accepted. Okay. Second. All right. Motion by Jane. Second by Joyce. Any further discussion on this issue to amend the host community agreement? No. Okay. Jennifer. Roll call vote. Phil. Yes. Chungalo. Yes. Stanley. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. It was Kevin. Yes. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Thank you for your time, guys. Yeah. Thank you very much. We're All looking right. forward to uh, getting started. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. All right. Christian, do you want to go back to the uh, diversity committee? Sure. Yeah. Um, I can just say that, you know, this uh, diversity committee um, has been meeting for a little while. I haven't unfortunately been able to make very many meetings uh, lately, um, but I did ask them to, you know, get the mission statement in front of the select board so that we could, um, 
you know, make it an official committee in town. And I see Deborah is here. I don't know if she has anything to say about the committee. Um, I was hoping, you know, that some members would come to, to say some things. Um, or is that, oh, it, and so, yeah, I uh, just, just wanted to, uh, you know, I don't know if we want to read the mission statement. I don't know if any of you have gotten a chance to uh, review it, uh, but uh, just something I know, I think is important in town to have this type of committee uh, moving forward. <laughs> I also think it will take someone to, you know, be an advocate of it and, and keep them moving forward and make sure they can interact with town officials because I think it's challenging for committees to see what's happening in town without someone that kind of knows what's going on. I only, it, it looks great to me. I only have one question and this is probably gonna sound silly for asking it, but I'm gonna ask it. Um, uh, the third or second bullet point from the bottom, uh, providing emergency and non-emergency assistance and safety. I was just, I guess I don't know what that means as, as far as from a diversity standpoint. I think it probably means if somebody is threatened because of being a subject to discrimination, that the town would offer to assist. And it, it's very loose in how it's spelled out there, but that's how I interpreted that. I think too, that's, uh, you know, if something were to happen in town, um, you know, with an employee or something along those lines, if, you know, we could uh, kind of res help respond to that issue. Uh, Deb. Most most of that's an executive session through council, so. Uh, Deb's on here. I just wanted to see if Deb had a chance to, to uh, see, throwing you under the bus here. If you had a chance to look at it from just an HR perspective and see if you, you were okay with it. I, I think uh, it's fine. Um, my thought when I read about the se security and emergency was um, homeland security and, and uh, people who are not uh, citizens of the country and protecting them, but perhaps I'm wrong. The, uh, that the providing emergency, is that what you're talking about, Deb? Yeah, that's what I, when I read that, I thought, well, maybe that's kind of like, I know that, you know, there's a church in Amherst that provides sanctuary and that Hadley would not go against that. That's what I thought that that meant. So yeah, I mean, if, if that's, if I'm wrong, yeah, that's if, what I was leading. That's what, um, that's all I can say. Yeah, we can always strike mm -hmm. that line if it's too much, you know. Yeah, I, I don't I, know the exact meaning, so I, I'm happy to take that off. I mean, I'm okay with it if we strike that line until we get some clarification on it, but I, I don't want to open that can of worms right now as far as uh, sanctuary and everything else. I, I'd like to get the committee moving forward and, and doing its important work, but I don't want to start up another mess in town at this at this point. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree <laughs> also. To, to get into controversial, I mean, obviously every issue has the potential of being controversial. I don't think we want to necessarily uh, get into controversial things right off the bat and try to have uh, outlandish goals, um, but, but also keep things in check and just make sure we're doing, we're on the right path and not on the wrong path when we're doing things more or less, you know? Yeah, yeah. I move that we accept this statement with the uh, line perverting, providing emergency and non-emergency assistance and safety removed. I can second. Okay. Motion by Jane, second by Christian. Any other discussion on this mission statement? No, Jennifer? Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Tungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Wiskevitz? 
Yes, did council take a look at this or not? I don't think we've ever given council a border committee uh, mission statement before, at least not in the ones that you formed in my tenure, well, if we're worried which sounds about, important. But if we're worried about a future controversy, I would suggest maybe they could look <laughs> at it and make sure we don't get in any, any further trouble. I just want to point out, John, I don't know if this will help is, you know, this type of committee is just an advisor to the select board. So anything they would do. Oh, I know. I understand that. Go through the select board. You know, I sat in a couple of the uh, race and diversity classes uh, with the MMIA, with the select board uh, classes we had a couple, three weeks ago or so. And, you know, they touched on a few of these subjects. And there's really nothing nothing in litigation right now it, it's all new to everyone you know uh the bigger cities are having bigger troubles than we are obviously i'm not saying that we don't have any issues at all but it, it may be just worth them taking a look at i think it's the right time for hadley to do something like this other towns around us are also forming committees deerfield been in the paper recently um, and I think it's up to the town administrator whether she thinks this needs to go before council or not yeah I, I mean I, I voted for it but I just want to bring it to everybody's attention because it's not an, a, a direct action John um, I, I am cautious of the cost of just having that reviewed for something like that I can reach, I have other things that I need to talk to our town council about tomorrow and I'll just say, hey, I've got a mission statement. Is it something that you think is necessary to review? And, and that might help. I just, I am cautious to having something reviewed with comments and. Yeah, if, if there's something else they feel that needs to be stricken or, or, or added, maybe, you know, they could help us out with it. If they're doing it with other towns. Okay. All right, so that's all set, and um, I appreciate your work with that, Christian, and and uh, bringing it back to the forefront. Because I, <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. <laughs> um, all right, anything else on diversity? Uh, you are looking for new members, though, right? There are people that are interested. Yeah, they they need new members. So um, always looking for members, always looking for interest. So definitely. Okay. Um, let's do liaison reports real quick. Um, I'll start off. We DPW is patching potholes and grinding tree stumps. And of course, putting lots and lots of salt on the road. So, um, I will just put out there. I got a little bit of flack from people. Um, so I just wanted to clarify something. I said that we were being more careful or injudicious with our use of salt. And uh, someone was concerned that our roads would be dangerous and, and whatever else. And I just want to clarify that uh, they are being salted and maintained as they are supposed to be. We're just being more cautious of how we use the salt and making sure that we're not spreading it and then immediately plowing it off the road 10 minutes later when the plow goes by or you know, putting excessive amounts of down. So, uh, I'm not trying to put anybody in danger, but we also want to be good stewards of our money and, and so that's that was my my statement to that effect so just to clarify um who wants to go next christian do you want to go general and library uh yeah i don't have anything really for general um library you know we kind of touched on that with patrick uh diversity we touched on that and just i also wanted to give a plug for the um, climate change committee um, be meeting next Thursday and just pushing for the green community designation coming up on town meeting. Um, you know, we're still working on getting the um, energy audits in town, but I don't know if anybody else has tried doing projects right now, but it's like 
if it's not one hurdle, it's another. If it's not COVID, it's the weather or vice versa. So it seems like that kind of thing is always getting in the way but uh, of progress, but um, you know, slowly making progress there and <clears throat> looking for uh, on that and options uh, in town as far as, you know, if anybody has any ideas about composting, um, waste collectively and those kind of things, you know, it's a good group to discuss with. That's all I have. All right, Joyce, anything from uh, police and fire? Uh, fire department, um, they are doing a their annual spaghetti supper at the senior center and pick up, I believe, is between two and three. They're not charging, but there will be a boot out there if anybody would like to donate to their association. And that is on February 26th. Uh, you need to call and make an appointment and reserve your dinners with the Hadley Senior Center. Um, but this is a great fundraiser for our fire department. Um, certainly, we all know what they do and uh, certainly appreciate everything that they do for us. So uh, I suggest that let's have them make all the spaghetti and meatballs that they can make and more than happy to, uh, you know, assist them with their association. As for the f police department, uh, really not too much. I didn't hear anything from Mike. Uh, we do have uh, some things going on later on, uh, you know, with contracts and things of that nature. So other than that, no, we're okay so far with police and fire and public safety. I have not heard from anything from the uh, building committee. Uh, Maybe it's time for us to regroup and see what's going on and uh, what we need to do when we can make some determination on what to do with uh, some of these buildings. So that would be our next step uh, coming along in the next month or so. Okay. Well, so if I can, uh, if I can uh, provide some input, I did meet with um, Tim and Gary this week and went over some projects. So okay. I can provide an update to the board. Okay, great. Thank you. Do you want to do that now, Carolyn? <laughs> no, there's a lot of them. <laughs> there was a lot. So, uh, how, about the, how, about the, how about the next meeting? How about the meeting? next meeting? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Or in an email. I'll do that. <laughs> That'd be great. John, anything from Park and Rec, Veterans, Hadley Media? Uh, Park and Rec was supposed to have a meeting last week. They canceled. They're going to have a meeting, I think, tomorrow. But uh, I'm going to check in with them again and see what's going on. Uh, um, Adley Media, I have not had any contact with them in a little while. but We're still on the air and we're still recording, so we're doing good. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. And then, so, uh, so, so, John, our... Um, we've had a little bit of discussion or I have about um, some interest in the North Hadley property that we have for different fields um, have, and you have been in contact. I set you up with Jim Shea last week, right? Or two weeks ago. Yeah. He's a little under the weather right now. That's why they canceled last week's meeting. So, okay. So I know they're just to put out there, um, people are interested in what we might be doing with the North Hadley property. So it might be good for a future discussion uh, of what we're anticipating or what we might want to use for that property. So, you know, just put everything under our hats. And if people have some suggestions or what we might be doing, I know we uh, had talked about before when we built the uh, sub fire station, we also talked about doing a uh, desperately needed a kennel for stray dogs and things to put uh, behind the safety complex. So uh, again, that's something that we should, you know, talk about at a future meeting just to have it on the agenda at some point. Yeah. And, and the property you're talking about is the nine acre parcel that the North substation is built on just correct correct yeah because people are showing an interest in that piece and 
So we have never really talked about what our plans are or what we anticipate use of that property. So, um, you know, again, let's, uh, you know, put our heads together and see what people come up with, uh, what they might feel is necessary up there. So it's all good to take suggestions and then we would have to make a determination on uh, what would be good for the town. All right. And okay. Jane. And anything? he's making a note so I don't forget. Wait a minute. Oh, sure. Um, so Senior Center, you've already heard, we've been busy um, helping people get COVID shots. We are setting up the AARP tax um, center where there will be, the tax repairs will be inside. The seniors will not come inside. We have a drop off box. They'll leave their things. They'll be called when their taxes are done. They'll come back and pick them up in a non-contact way. Um, and we're looking forward to having people back in our building once we can get shots on them. School board is, as you know, open now. Uh, the school, well, they're on vacation now, but they're open starting next week, assuming the numbers stay the same. And people are looking forward to that. And that's my two committees for the moment. All right, sounds good. Uh, let's see, next is uh, select board policies and procedures. We had talked about replacing the uh, building updates we were doing every meeting with talking about some bigger issues. And uh, we didn't, I don't know if we had enough time to pull it together, but a couple of the pressing issues that we have coming up, um, you know, contract related stuff. Uh, we said we were gonna take a look at um, the transfer station services. I know that's a hot ticket item for a lot of residents that are just very unhappy with the service that's being provided or how it's being provided. And so we've, we've had an informal sort of agreement with uh, Solid Waste Solutions for, for many years. And um, I think it's time to put that out for a formal RFP and see what we can provide in the way of better services and maybe cheaper or maybe provide some revenue to the town because my understanding is right now we allow them to use that facility for free, um, allow them to use the space. So maybe there's something that we could do better. Um, any thoughts on that? Any feedback on? Well, people, like I said to you, David, uh, people are a little bit disappointed that they have no place to take their leaves as they, as they did before. At least people were able to bring their leaves and uh, I believe one of our town vehicles would go down and load up whatever it was needed to, to haul those leaves out of there. Um, I wish there was a better solution for people and their leaves. I, you know, like uh, fields or things like that, that, you know, farmers or whatever wouldn't mind people dumping their leaves. It, but, you know, then people get carried away and they don't pay attention to what they, it's not only leaves they put out there, it's all other pardon the expression, shit. So, you know, yeah. we, we, that's, we, that's what, you happens. Know, that's what happens. And, you know, you can't do that's that. The if, they, if they would only do leaves, it would be a different story, but people just don't do that. So they're not trustworthy. I hate to say that. Um, and that's really important for farm, farmland, you know, that you do what you're supposed to do. But again, I would like to have a facility where we, they could bring their leaves and have them haul them away or do whatever they need to do with them. So I think that's something that we def, you know, definitely need to look into. Yeah, I definitely would go at the RFP. Joyce, that's what happened. It got so out of control with the leaves and the stumps and the trees yeah. and branches, bags and plastic, and it just went on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I myself have been over to the Northampton transfer station a few times and he's running a real nice clean operation over there. And yeah. I don't know if he's interested in bidding on it or not, but you know, he, he does a good job over there. Uh, Is that the one on Locust Street? No, the one on uh, the East Hampton Northampton line. The Glendale oh. Road? Oh, that's where. No, no not on Glendale shut down now, Jane. That's, that's yeah. going to turn into a dog park. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, this is over by the old dump. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, it was Allen's that uh, yeah, used to run. Allen's place, yeah. Yep, that used to run a dump there, and my my dad and I used to take the dump there every week. Um, so you know that that's another you know thing that we need to probably offer our citizens at least something that they can uh, get rid of things that they need to. So. You know, I don't mind them using the property if we're all permitted for it and they can run an operation that's open a little bit more and a little bit more sensitive to the to, to taxpayers, you know? Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. And you know, we don't know. They may be the best bet, but maybe not. So it doesn't hurt to see what we what else we can find. Yeah. Right. And I think starting earlier, I mean, last year with COVID, it was really last minute. So starting earlier makes a lot of sense. Another thing, another thing I'd like to add to that list, Joyce has already put on the use of the North Hadley Fire Station land, something we should be talking about as a board. We need to keep after the uh, contract with Charter Spectrum and not just let that sneak up on us without any kind of planning about what that's going to be. Well, as your uh local president of the, no, <laughs> chairman of the uh, cable <laughs> contract renewal committee. Uh, I can tell you, we have met two or three times and we are working on gathering data as far as um, subscribers and coming up with survey questions. There's a, a very extensive multi-year process we have to go through. Um, so we're going to do surveys to all the town residents, which is required to gather the data. So hopefully we're going to offer an online option and then an in-person option for maybe seniors at the senior center that don't have computers or the ability to do a, a survey. We have to gather data of about areas of concern, um, what people like and don't like. And then it, this renewal process, like I said, it's multi-year. So we, we go back to charter or spectrum, whatever, and basically tell them what our problems are, give them a chance to fix it. And if they can't fix it or can't fix it to our satisfaction, then we have the, the opportunity to put it out for bid and go elsewhere. So, so we are working on it. Um, it's just a very long process and the process officially starts in March. We have to send them notice that, that we're starting our renewal committee. So um, we're just getting a little bit of a head start so we can get everything together. Wonderful. Uh, Great. The uh, building maintenance and janitorial, I know that that is ongo an ongoing concern. And I know that we had said we would revisit the janitorial contract just to kind of get some feedback of how things are working or not working. And if, you know, that's something that I think is up in June, right? Was that correct? End of June, um, yes. Yeah. So I, I just want to put that on our radar too, that... Um, you know, we need to decide how we're going to renew that and uh, if the current contract satisfies what we're looking for or if we need more and whether I, it, yeah. I think now that we're talking about having people in the buildings, we will get a better, better sense because up until now, it's been really limited to staff in terms of what's being cleaned for. And that's a much different load for cleaning than traffic, if you will. And I think uh, some input from Gary on maybe what we should be doing or need to be doing for these new buildings to uh, keep up with them, you know, whether it's power washing or whatever on the outside. The senior center is also looking at our, um, our whole list of warranties and see if there's some places it would be advantageous to have service contracts. I know the fire station has somebody come in and do um, HVAC a service contract where they change the filters and they lubricate things. And our system is not dissimilar from that. And so we're exploring the possibility of what that would involve for the different systems that would need it. Most of them don't need anything because of their warranties or, you know, flooring doesn't have a serious problem in terms of having somebody check it every year, but other things do. And I, I just want to remind people also that when you have a new building, you have one year to do a punch list and make sure everything is done that you need to have done. So we need to be on top of this. 
for the first year that the buildings are open and making sure that everything is in working order to what our specifications are because there is only that one year time frame that we're covered. Right, and that's a serious problem, for instance, in all of the buildings, well, fire station less, but if, when the buildings are not in use, you can't really tell if it's going to serve the, the use it was built for. Correct. The people trafficking through it are is totally different. So yeah. yeah, we're trying as best we can and we're finding little glitches and they're coming and fixing them and we're really pleased with that. Yeah, so we, we just make sure our punch list is good and you know, that's really important. I found that. Uh, I was like a dog with a bone at the hospital when we built our new addition and we had the new joint center and we had leaking windows in one of our sitting areas. I was going like, would somebody please fix this? And I did it for over a year and they never did it until I don't know how long it took them to actually do it. But I was like crazy about it. Let me tell you, <laughs> I think they were sick of me in the engineering department. <laughs> But those are some just some of the things that we always want to look for. And I'm even though the North Hadley Fire Station is not used all the time, it's still stuff that we need to make sure that everything is maintained as it should be for a year and making sure that it is working order. And the other thing as a town we need to be really careful of is that we continue to maintain these new buildings and not let them deteriorate. Yep. And well, as you say, that may be washing outside. It may be things that we haven't figured out yet, but somehow it needs to be done. We can't just say, oh, no, it's new. We don't have to do that this year. We'll put it off. No, annual maintenance, annual maintenance. We definitely don't want another Russell School. So, <laughs> <laughs> And I think not this year, because this is not a good year to say these words, but we should be having a fund for building maintenance that every year we put money into. And then when something happens, we don't have to go to town meeting. That money is there. As I said, not this year, but we need to get that in the long range plan. Agreed. Agreed, Agreed Jane. Absolutely. Just like we do for the water treatment plant where we put money in for the filters, we should still do these for our buildings. I agree. Exactly. So, I'd like to keep on these few items. So we have the, the land or transfer station. We have, uh, I guess I can give a cable cable update, you know, once a month or something like that of, of what we're doing. Uh, we have building maintenance and punch list and also the land issue behind uh, the fire station. Is that pretty much all we talked about? Yep. That's all we've talked about so far. I have a huge list, but I think that's enough for tonight. We'll, we'll take bite-sized pieces. <laughs> but I, I really believe, I mean, now that I'm on the board, I really believe it's important for us as the select board of this town to make serious policy that affects the town. And we need to take enough time to discuss it in a serious manner so that we can make the correct decisions. God knows, God knows, Jane, we've tried. <laughs> well, I'm just trying again. Christian, you had something? Yeah, I was just going to say the DPW, you know, the trailers, the offices there. I mean, we really need to talk about how we're going to get to the next level with them because that's just something that, I mean, it's it's been a problem for a while and just needs to be addressed. So adding that to the list uh, seems, seems important because it's just a matter of time before something happens there that, uh, you know, we need, we need to address. So is, I agree with that. Is that still on capital? as well or no that's capital i mean it is capital however uh, it's one of these things that needs advocacy and you know if you look at the senior center you look at the library those were both two committees that really drove that forward even and the fire um substation as well the chief really took hold of doing that there was a committee form that really had a lot of momentum around that i feel like there isn't that same level of excitement around the DPW because you don't have that volunteer organization, whether it's, you know, um, at the, at the fire department is, has a volunteer component. The senior center has a volunteer component. The DPW really doesn't. And so. Bring up a DPW committee. 
yeah, I mean, maybe we need a, con a, a building committee, but I think we just need the select board to come up with something to kind of put that forward. It takes something internal to get it going, I feel like. No, three, three or five professionals for a DPW, not a board, but a committee that can concentrate just on DPW issues, water, sewer, highway. There's Board of Public Works in every city and town around us. And we got rid of the sewer commission and we took it all on ourselves. It's just too much for this board to handle all of it at once. So, I, think that may be true of, <laughs> I think that may be true of a lot of the uh, things that are going on in this town that the town keeps growing and we don't keep adding support for the, the people who have to be in these roles. And we need to, when the money changes, look at that also. Okay. Um, we have 7.6 North Hadley Village Hall. We're actually going to take that up in uh, executive session uh, just because it has to do with contract negotiations. So if anyone's waiting for that, but I did want to give a uh, last call for announcements before we go, do go into executive session. I do have one question. Sure. Um, we had talked last year about changing the annual election to after town meeting. Is that going on this year's warrant? I don't know. I, I think, it, I think it's an appropriate yet. thing to do because it re keeps the people who are speaking at town meeting, then whoever's elected happens after that meeting and they're responsible for what goes on and they have heard the will of the town and the people who are speaking at town meeting have been responsible for getting us there to those positions. I'm trying to remember last year it was, I think it was withdrawn because it was one of the more controversial topics we thought. And I think just for the sake of time, was there a reason that we pulled it off or was there a lack of support for that? Oh, Amy's here, she, Amy. <laughs> Hi. So uh, I originally, I think I was the one that brought it up in the first place um, to save some money. Um, come to find out, there's a lot more to it um, with how many days between the election and um, it has to do with Jess Spanknable. We need to talk to the, the clerk and find out exactly how many days we need. Um, so if there was um, in the town meeting, someone voted for a debt exclusion and we have to bring it to a ballot, we want that ballot to coincide with the same time that we have the town election so that we don't have to have two um, elections. Right? That makes sense. So, but we have, I think it has to be a discussion here about uh, the timing and um, how it will affect everything. So uh, Jess has those numbers. I There was quite a bit to it. So I think, um, um, some research, I think it's a good idea. And if it's at all possible, when I did my research, it looked like most towns in Massachusetts were all, um, that's what they did. They did the election either the same day as the meeting or it was after. Only very few do it before. Um, so I think with some talking to the clerk um, and uh, figuring out, out, I think it is a good thing to look at and to, to do. Jane, is that something that you would want to uh, do some research on, maybe with Amy and Jess? Amy, you and I can talk to Jess about that. How's that? That sounds good. I, I, right. I do. I definitely think it's something important. I just, I, I said, I told uh, David last time I thought we should pull it because I didn't think we were ready. Because when uh, I found out from the clerk that there was more to it, I didn't know that. Okay. So, when is the deadline for warrant submission? They haven't opened it yet. No, we did open it, I think. Oh, yeah. I'm senile. Forget oh, it. I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> I had so too much morning, on my plate. <laughs> Joyce, on our schedule right now, which we've modified a little bit, so it doesn't mean it's set in stone, but I have to look at the timing. Uh, the warrant should be complete and sent for legal review by March 31st. Okay. So 
I know we, we haven't, haven't we haven't closed it yet. No. But do, have, but do you have coming election? All the dates are set for this year. So. For this year, this would be for the following year. Yeah. But if it's closing on the 31st and we only have two March meetings, that means either the 3rd or the 17th, we need to talk about this because the 17th I hear is busy with the budget or Joyce, we could have another meeting. Let me, uh, Joyce loves meetings. <laughs> That's I, I love, I love my life right now. What more could I ask for? Well, we, we may need an, an extra meeting in, in March anyways, because of all the annual town meeting stuff, but we'll, if, if you can pull together the research, I'm happy to put it on whatever meeting you're ready for, or if we need to make a new meeting, we'll make one. So, okay, great. Okay. Um, any other announcements before we go to executive? I guess I'm able to do one because it was on legacy that we have the passing of Patrick Serio. Um, Pat has been so instrumental in our town in, um, since my children were in school and maybe even before that of uh, videotaping soccer games and basketball games and any other function that happened here in town. And um, he was just a great guy, great personality. And I just want to extend our, our sympathies to his wife and his family. Um, I'm, I'm saddened by the passing of Pat and, uh, it did say in the obituary that it was from COVID. So I am sad to see that this disease has taken him from us. So, so sorry for that. Any other announcements? All right, so we have three uh, items for executive session. So I'm gonna read all three of them and then we'll vote to go into executive session and we're gonna uh, take them all in this same executive session. So uh, the select board will enter into executive session per MGL chapter 30A section 21A2 uh, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. And this is with the chief of police. And the next one is we will hold an executive session per the provisions of MGL chapter 30A section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. If an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and the chair so declares. And this is the DPW union dispatchers and police department. And the final. And the final executive session is for North Hadley Village Hall's uh, hall negotiations. So I, I do declare that this would have a detrimental effect. So I need a motion to go to executive session. So moved. Second. All right, motion by Joyce, second by Christian. And Jennifer, roll call. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Chunglo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. Thank you. All right, so we will not reconvene an open session. And so good night to everybody, and we'll see you on March 3rd.